From inside our two-bedroom apartment in downtown Baltimore, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. Paul Mankata, Brendan Mortensen, here with you. As always, <laughs> Brendan, how you doing? I'm great. Good. Uh, the Orioles have not been doing as well. They have not. But you know what? Uh, that's kind of the state of baseball at this point. No hitters seem to remember how to hit. Yeah. At the beginning of this season, and uh, the Orioles scuffled against the Mets, but I think that's just kind of the state of baseball at this point. It is. Uh, the we're going to talk a little bit in this podcast about you know what is going on with the Orioles and whether that's indicative of what's going on around baseball or whether they stand out uh, amongst the pack in terms of their offensive futility that they're going through right now. Um, because the stats are kind of interesting when you, we're going to dig into it. But Brendan, uh, I was down in Bowie yesterday mm. in, a, in a place that a lot of Orioles fans have been flocking to, one of many of the, uh, the Orioles sites, spring training, or spring training, minor league sites, <laughs> It's early. I was there late last night. Uh, actually, I left in the fourth inning. Yeah, you left, left at a really unfortunate I, time. Well, I was there to see Kyle Bradish. I had never seen the guy pitch because or, most Orioles fans have not seen the guy pitch because he just came over uh, at the end of the 2019 season in the Dylan Bundy trade, has been flying up Orioles prospect rankings for uh, pretty much since he came over. And then 2020 happens and we don't get to see him in the minor leagues and everybody raves about him at the alternate site, and he delivered yesterday. He was awesome. Uh, I think he had ended up with five Ks and four-plus innings. Uh, really good stuff. And I was like, all right, well, I've seen Kyle Bradish. I've seen Adley catch him. It's a nothing-nothing game. I might miss some runs. I leave in the top of the fourth. They score four in the, in the bottom of the fourth and five in the bottom of the fifth, including an Adley Rutschman dinger. And I, uh, I did, not, did not catch that, Brendan. No, no, you didn't. And as soon as you, you got back, I did make you feel bad about it. Um, and I don't regret it. Yeah, and I deserve it, yeah. frankly. So either... I mean, how could you not know that as soon as you left, Adley Rutschman yeah. was going to hit a home run? So either my timing is terrible, or... I think it's that. I'm bad luck. I think it's both, actually, yeah. now that you say that. Yeah, exactly. Both would make the most sense to me. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it was a monster shot. I just want to bring that up. It was yeah. a monster homer yesterday. Yeah. Um... All right, shall we talk about the Major League team? We should. We could. You start us off. We might. Well, Matt Harvey returned to City Field yesterday. How about that? Uh, he did not pitch all that well. Yeah. But it was a really cool moment uh, because Matt Harvey, obviously, early in his career, meant a lot to the Mets. He was kind of the face of this future rotation that they were building with Matt Harvey, Noah Syndergaard, and a young Jacob deGrom. Of course, Harvey uh, did not turn out to be the best of those three because of injuries and everything like that. But it was a really cool moment for Matt Harvey to come back to City Field and pitch against his former team. Yeah, I mean, I we posted about it on, on social media after the game about his emotions after the game, and I saw some kind of snarky comments as, as people are you know used to being. Uh, on social media about, you know, oh, he got the standing ovation because he got hit around. All right, let's, let's you know, appreciate that this is kind of a cool moment for the guy. He has had a long journey to get back to this point. Um, and he was so good in, uh, with that Mets organization at the beginning of his career. And he, you know, went through some tough times. And part of it, he admitted, was due to his own making. He kind of created a situation there for himself. And he had a lot of people who were... Um, kind of enablers, I guess you could say, and, and allowed him to do what he wanted in that Mets organization. And um, because of that, he admitted that, you know, he kind of struggled and bounces around to a couple different franchises and comes back uh, as an opposing pitcher. And honestly, look, he didn't pitch well yesterday. It was his, you know, first kind of blow-up start that we've seen. All pitchers are going to have blow-up starts. I think we expected at least one blow-up start from Matt Harvey. Um, but he got back there as... A pitcher was actually pitching pretty well this year, and it's kind of a nice, I'm not completion to the journey, but it's a nice note to come back home like that when you found yourself in a different city. Yeah, and obviously Matt Harvey has not been great over the last few years, but let's not forget, he was a key piece of a team that went to the World Series. Yeah. Like, this is not a guy who was just kind of average for the Mets for a little while. This was, from a very young age, Matt Harvey looked like a perennial Cy Young candidate in New York. Yeah. 
and he was representing all this hope for the city. So Matt Harvey with a very well-deserved standing ovation yesterday. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, on the bad side of that, the Orioles got uh, got kind of crushed yesterday. Yeah. And you can blame a lot of that on Matt Harvey, but I think the bigger problem here, Brendan, is the offense. Uh, the offense has been scuffling for a while, and I think that you can blame part of that on the fact that Anthony Santander has not played in a game in about, you know, almost a month. Um, and he was expected to be a big piece of your offense. But there are bigger problems uh, that kind of loom here. And I think that you can't really place them all on Anthony Santander not being there because some of the big hitters in the lineup are, are not really delivering. I mean, Trey has been much better, obviously. Um, Austin Hayes, I think, has been just about fine. And Cedric Mullins is still hitting uh, out of his mind. But the rest of the lineup is not really carrying its weight. Yeah, I mean, regardless of who is pitching, Matt Harvey could have given up three runs yesterday in a good start, and you're still not going to win that game because the Orioles score just three runs total yeah. in this brief two-game series against the Mets. That's not going to win you many games regardless of who is pitching, whether it's right. John Means or Matt Harvey, that's just not going to win any games. Yeah. And you alluded to the middle of the lineup not hitting very well. I think part of the big problem, too, is that the bottom of the lineup is really not doing anything. I mean, you get past four, five, six with Trey Mancini, Ryan Mountcastle, and Freddie Galvis. The bottom of the lineup has done pretty much nothing. And if you need any other indication, look at Cedric Mullins' RBI numbers. He's been the best hitter on the team far and away for the entire year, and he barely has any RBIs because nobody is on base when Cedric Mullins comes to bat. Yeah, well, the, the problem also, though, is like, so we, we have seen this around baseball. I mean, John Means' no-hitter was followed two days later by a no-hitter from Wade Miley, yeah. former Oriole great Wade Miley, which I'm not going to say it took any shine off of John Means' no-hitter, but it was, you know, I think the more both, that happen, the less they become. Yeah, I think we both kind of sat here while that Wade Miley no-hitter was happening and just went, what? Yeah. Wade Miley? Happy for him. Happy for yeah, him. That's absolutely. great. That's a, uh, you know, a guy who's had a long career in the bigs. Has had, you know, I wouldn't say some tremendous highs. He's no, you know, but been he's, a he's gone through a pitcher. bit of a career renaissance over the last few years. Yeah. He's reinvented himself a little bit, but still, it's it's Wade Miley. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's not just the no hitters. It's teams around baseball are hitting a career low. They're they're not, you know, they're striking out more than they're hitting. All that kind of stuff, and you know, not to be an old fashioned kind of put the ball in play kind of guy here but but you're gonna be an old-fashioned put the ball in play kind a, of guy. but there is a problem there is a problem yeah. and i'm not gonna say that it's the hitter's fault and they just need to because it's it's a trend around baseball it's not like if the hitters could be doing better if they could be finding some hole to exploit here in the system they would be doing it it's not like they're just lazy and they're stuck in their ways and they're not figuring out ways to always this is an incredibly competitive group of people when you talk about major league baseball players if there is a thing that they can exploit here, they will exploit it. And right now, pitching is just, you know, progressing at a faster rate than hitting is. And I think it's going to be a back and forth. I think we'll see an adjustment in the second half of the season and in the seasons going forward. Yeah. Right now, we know about the baseballs and they may have been dejuiced and all of this. And it's kind of taken away from that three true outcome style of baseball. And I think hitters at this point just need to adjust to the fact that the balls that might have been home runs last year are not home runs this year yeah. in a lot of cases. And you're probably just not going to get the same launch angle that you used to. The launch angle might not help you as much as it was in previous years. So I think the hitters will adjust. But right now, it's a pitcher's league. Clearly, the pitchers are absolutely dominating. And when you say three true outcome baseball, you mean walks, home runs, strikeouts. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the opposite of that is balls in play. Any kind of right. any kind of ball that is put, uh, you know, in the infield or outfield, whether it is a hit or not, and there are just not enough balls in play. So it can be frustrating. And I think uh, you know you tune into your team every night, and Orioles fans tune into the Orioles every night and say, why aren't they hitting? But people who are watching the league on a larger level are just as concerned with the fact that. The, some of the best hitters around the league aren't hitting, and some of the teams are not hitting at the high, at nearly a high enough rate um, to 
make up for how dominant the pitching has been. Yeah, and you are not allowed to use Mike Trout as a counter argument. Yeah. That hitters are still good. He does not count in the argument. He's, he is always going to be good no matter as, what. You can't use him as any kind of argument for no. any human being because no, he's correct. not. He is ascended above. I, I did see something on Twitter the other day that was like, hey, Mike Trout is still hitting. And it was like, well, yeah. <laughs> do you see Mike Trout like flip in the outfield yesterday? Not flip, but he did it like he banged into somebody and then nothing uh, surprises did me like Mike a Trout. backwards cartwheel and landed on his feet. It was it was incredible. He is Superman. I feel like if you threw him at middle linebacker on an NFL team. He would be just fine. This is just your call to get him on the Eagles at this point. I think so. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, anyway, the Orioles. The Orioles. <laughs> yeah. So it, it is a problem around baseball. However, it is still something that the Orioles definitely need to address on their own team on a micro level. And there are a couple spots in that lineup that you mentioned, Brendan. It's not just the second half of the lineup, but you point out some weak, weak spots in the lineup for these everyday players. And... Um, I think it's time that we start talking about Rio Ruiz at second. It's time we start talking about Chance Cisco behind the plate. It's time we start talking about Ramon Urias at second as well. And talking about now that we have a, you know, sample size that is longer than a month, we're into the, you know, past the 30 game sample size. We're getting into the 50, almost 50 game sample size range. We can stop saying, you know, it's just a cold streak to start the season. Or, and, and just start saying, this guy's not having a great year. Yeah, and in Rio Ruiz's case, this isn't somebody who the Orioles went, oh, let's give him a shot for 2021, let's see what happens. Rio Ruiz has been getting his chance for the last three seasons. Yeah. This year, he came out and surprised everybody when he played a really good second base defensively. In that first series against Boston, everyone went, wow, look at this, this is cool. And then Rio Ruiz didn't hit again, and everyone went, yeah, we're tired of this. Rio Ruiz hitting just 161 on the year. He has one home run since April 17th. It's been time for Rio Ruiz, I think. He has gotten more than his fair share of chances at the major league level, and there are two guys in the minors that are knocking on the door that can take his position versatility pretty easily at second and third. Name them. That would be Rylan Bannon, yep. number one, and Jemai Jones, who yep. doesn't play third base, but he also does give you some outfield versatility. Well, with Rio Ruiz, we kind of wrote the, um, you know, we thought that we were giving our last podcast with Rio Ruiz as a member of the Orioles when Michael Franco signed. Yeah. We, we were expecting Rio Ruiz to be optioned down to AAA or be DFA'd or... I don't know, even tried to trade it for, you know, another kind of fringe roster player or cash considerations or something because we didn't think that he was going to be able to stick. And to his credit, he has stuck on this team as a second baseman and actually done not just pretty well, he's been above average defensively at second baseman, at, at second base. The Orioles as a team with Rio Ruiz mostly starting at second and some Ramon Urias, who is also a, a plus defender at second, they're second in defensive rating at the second base position, according to fan graphs. So they're really good defensively. And even Rio Ruiz's baseball reference war is on the plus side because of his defensive rating. He's plus, he's 0.4 on the positive side on defensive uh, war, according to baseball reference. And it, his offense takes a, the, you know, a little bit away from that. But he still is, according to baseball reference, an above average player slightly so far this season, even though he is hitting 161. But it's solely the defense. Right. Is the reason yeah, that Rio is, Ruiz. He has turned into a one sided player at this right. point. Right. And if you were going to keep somebody who was a solely good defensive player at second base, you never would have gotten rid of Yolmer Sanchez because Yolmer Sanchez was a gold glove winner at second base. And you had him going into the 2021 season, but you opted to keep Rio Ruiz because you thought that the offense would be better from him than Yolmer Sanchez, I'm presuming. And, and he's younger than Yolmer Sanchez as right. well. And, and is a guy in-house as opposed to somebody that they claimed off waivers. So they're, so they're probably more likely to keep the guy in-house. But at this point, when you've got both Ryland Bannon and Jemai Jones who are hitting very well in the minor league level, they're both at AAA right now. 
at least personally, Paul, I would much rather have somebody who's hitting even 250 and playing slightly above average defense than somebody like Rio Ruiz, who is playing very good defense, but is never going to be on base for you. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's at, at a certain point, it's becoming a little bit of that second base spot is becoming a, a kind of a black hole in the lineup. And, it, and it's Ramon Urias as well, hitting 212. He's got just one homer, 601 OPS for Urias. Another guy who on the is on the positive side, according to baseball reference, in terms of war because of what he brings defensively. And they're both 26 years old. So, you know, it's it's clear that they would rather, if this was Yolmer Sanchez, I think, hitting 161 and playing very well defensively at second base, I think that they would be quicker to pull the plug because it's somebody that they don't have much invested in. They do still have something invested in Rio Ruiz and maybe a tiny bit in Ramon Urias because they are still just 26 years old. I mean, some of the Orioles' top prospects are 25. You right. know, the guys that we're going to talk about to take their spots, Rylan Bannon is 25. Right. So at what point do you give up on a guy? That's always the, the difficult thing to... To determine, I mean, we talk about Cedric Mullins, and Mullins was a little bit younger. He was like 24. But Mullins was hitting incredibly poorly when he made the opening day roster in 2019, and they optioned him down, and they optioned him down again before he came back up and hit poorly again in 2020. So, like, there, you can give guys opportunities, and Cedric Mullins is the exception here. He's not the rule. So maybe there is something left in Rio Ruiz, but we have got a pretty large sample size of the, at this point, and we still ha- we have not seen good Rio Ruiz offensively in a while. Yeah, that's the difference for me between Rio Ruiz and Ramon Arias. Ramon Arias, we haven't gotten a huge sample size from. I mean, he played a little bit last year. He has played pretty sparingly so far in 2021. He is just hitting 212. But I think with Ramon Arias, he is probably the one out of the two that you would give a little bit more time to. If you were to ask me which one I would rather keep on the roster between Urias and Rio Ruiz. And the other thing to keep in mind with Urias is that he is your backup shortstop at this point as well. Ryland Bannon could come up for Rio Ruiz right now and play both second base and third base. And that's what Rio Ruiz has been giving you. Ryland Bannon and Jemai Jones aren't going to come up and play shortstop more than likely. So unless you were to call up Richie Martin instead of Ramon Urias you wouldn't have a backup shortstop for Freddie Galvis. Right. So I think because Ramon Urias can play shortstop, he probably is safer than Rio Ruiz because you need a backup for Freddie Galvis. But Jemai Jones and Ryland Bannon right now could come up and take the positions from Rio Ruiz. Well, and both Ruiz and Urias still have options remaining. Right. So you can option them down. It's not like, you know, you if you try to option them, which... We're going to talk about with Sean Armstrong a little bit. You have to DF, you have to expose him to waivers and then, um, you know, hope that he clears through. So you can option any of these guys down to, to AAA and not have to worry about it. The question is, when do you want to do that? Um, because I know that they don't want to get in a situation where they option Rio Ruiz or Ramon Urias down. They bring up Jemai Jones and Rylan Bannon and they struggle as well. And then the question is, all right. <laughs> Do you option them down, and do it, does it just become a carousel? You want somebody to kind of take the job and run with it, and nobody has done that yet. Um, if you had your pick of of uh, Bannon or Jemai, who would you bring up first? Look, personally, I would bring up both of them. I would just kind of rip the Band-Aid off and, and go for both. But right now, I'd probably say Ryland Bannon because he can play both second base and third base. Uh, he's got an 886 OPS in his seven games with AAA Norfolk so far. He's got two home runs, two doubles. So I think Ryland Bannon is probably my option there because he's 25 years old and he's yet to make his major league debut. I think now is his time. But Jemai Jones is making a very strong case in AAA as well. He's got a 924 OPS in six games, five hits, one double, two triples, and a home run. He's just 23 years old, but he's already made his major league debut. I would call up both right now, honestly. The the Orioles lineup needs a spark, and I think both of these guys are plus defenders from everything that we've heard, and they are both raking in AAA. Would you option both Urias and Rio? I think I would... Which two roster spots would they take? I would option Rio, and I think right now I would say uh, I would option Ryan McKenna, 
and I would bring up Jemai Jones because Jemai right. Jones can play the outfield. Yeah. And you don't really need Ryan McKenna if you're going to have Jemai Jones on the roster because Jemai Jones can play either of those corner outfield positions. And then you can also try him at second base as well. So I would rather have Jemai Jones on the roster at this point than Ryan McKenna. Yeah, well, when you said uh, Ryland Bannon, you would bring him up over Jemai because of the pos- positional versatility between second and third. You could you could make the case the same case for Jemai. Right. You know, he hasn't played third base at all yet, but can play center field. Right. Uh, which is you know similar to what Ryan McKenna offers. Yeah, and the only issue with Jemai Jones is that as long as Ryan McKenna is on the major league roster you don't really need his outfield versatility because right. if an outfielder is taking a day's rest, Ryan McKenna probably gets that spot. But if you are giving Jemai Jones Ryan McKenna's roster spot, then he is able to use that outfield versatility in the corners if needed. Right. I would agree with you, though. I do think Bannon is probably would be my pick to come up first because, yeah, I mean, you don't need, as so long as you have McKenna, and McKenna is clearly ahead of those guys in terms of priority, in terms right. of, uh, you know, where they think he is closer to the bigs. So if he's going to be on the roster or if he's close enough, you opt for McKenna in, as your outfield depth. Right. And then infield depth, you go with, with Bannon. And I think, I think we're going to see Bannon at some point soon. If I had to guess, and this is not with any inside information here but we've seen this front office already call up Zach Lowther a little bit earlier than we expected Keegan Aiken is now back with the the big league club we predicted it we said it was going to be about a month it was almost exactly a month before the breakfast incident unfortunately which he required stitches (laughs) the notorious breakfast incident with caps TBI yeah we're just going to refer to it as TBI yeah now um we almost got it right on the nose in terms of prediction for how long it was going to yeah. take for Keegan. And good to see him back with the team. And we'll see if he uh, if he gets back in the rotation at some point soon. But, you know, so I think that this team might, and we're into May now. You know, we're not we're past the, the first month of the season. You can start to call some guys up if you want. And also not have to worry too much about service time. Yeah. So I think that we could see Bannon at some point soon. Yeah, and the important thing to remember with Ryland Bannon, too, he's 25. Yeah. So if he's going to make his major league debut, it's going to be sometime soon, you would assume. Because yeah. it, what else? Uh, obviously, he's only played seven games with AAA so far. But with an OPS close to 900 and a lineup yeah. at the major league level that is really struggling, I don't know how you can look at Ryland Bannon and what he's doing at AAA and say that he wouldn't at least provide a spark for this Orioles lineup. Yeah, eight hits in those seven games, two doubles, two homers. Um, yeah, and, and obviously, tiny sample size, but right. he did hit well at AAA. The small exposure that he got at the end of the 2019 season, uh, he's been pretty good at the alternate site in 2020 and the beginning of 2021 from all that we've heard. So um, I think he could be very close to ready. And you don't need to play him every day, you know, because I think that I would be more comfortable and I think that the, the coaching staff would probably be more comfortable with not ripping that Band-Aid off and just taking it one at a time, right. just because you don't want to, you know, it can be tough. To, you hand Ryland Bannon the second base job and say, go get it. Like, he could have a, you know, Richie Martin style, just kind of, he gets the opening day job and he struggles. And he's kind of stuck there because there's nobody who can really take that spot. So what I would do is I would probably try to keep Ramon Arias. Or, uh, you know, if you're going to option Rio, keep Ramon Arias there. Or if you're going to, or other way around. Uh, so that Rylan Bannon can slowly get his feet wet, which is what they've been doing with Ryan McKenna. It's what they did with Zach Lowther, giving him the relief appearance before he made that start. And they you know, put him back in the bullpen because they think that if they need him, and I think if he does come back up, he probably will come back up in the bullpen. Same with Keegan Aiken. They're not, and they don't need to, throw these guys right in and try to have them grab a job. They they want to ease them in, and I think it's the right approach. Right, and, and there's no saying that Rylan Bannon's hitting numbers at the AAA level will necessarily translate to the majors. Right. But you have to think that he will probably hit better than Rio Ruiz's 161. You'd think? You would think. So I think it's worth a shot. I would agree with you. I think in my ideal scenario, I would option Rio Ruiz, call up Ryland Bannon, and keep Ramon Urias. In my ideal world, I would also call up Jemai Jones and option Ryan McKenna back to AAA, but I think at this point, Ryan McKenna, like you said, probably has the leg up on Jemai Jones, so 
but I, I think they just need to call up one of them for a spark at this point. Yeah. Um, also, Jermai has not played since May 9th. Not sure entirely why, whether it's been injury related or not, but uh, yeah. they are, and I know the, the O's are obviously taking things uh, with a different approach, especially with the starting pitchers uh, in terms of the workload to start the minor league season. Right. But uh, all right. Other op- other spots in the roster on the roster and the open their, uh, you know, kind of everyday players that could use some uh, tinkering. Yeah. Uh, the catcher spot. I think Chance Cisco. The catcher spot has been uh, not great. For the Orioles so far, Pedro Severino has not played up to how he played in the first half of 2020. And Chance Sisko uh, has not been good. Yeah, Chance Sisko, we are pretty used to him getting on base from the walks. He is not doing that along with not hitting. He's hitting just 171 so far with a 227 on base percentage. We're used to that being a lot higher because he has good plate discipline. But the walks have not been there. The batting average has not been there. And the defense has not been there either. It, he is not getting it done from either side of the plate at this point. And obviously, the clamoring at the catcher spot is going to be call up Adley Rutschman. But that is not going to happen for a while. Adley Rutschman is still at the double A level, and he's hitting just 214 so far in a small sample size. He does a long have home two run home that runs. I didn't see yesterday. Right. Yeah. He does have those two home runs, and we are assuming that Adley is going to pick up the pace offensively at the double A level, but you're not going to rush him. You don't, so, yeah, you're not going to rush him. Yeah. You do need, he does need a little bit more time. The pun, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, at uh, today's day and age, Kind of rare for guys, obviously, to go directly from Double A to the bigs, and he's only played a handful of games at the Double A level. Right, so, he's he's played seven games so far. Yeah, if he does go directly from Double A to the big leagues, they're going to make sure he plays a lot more than seven games. Right, uh, before he does that. Yeah, I mean, we knew that coming into the season that Cisco and Severino were both somewhat placeholders, and they were probably hoping that one of those two would be able to prove enough to be the backup. Going forward, you know, maybe um, once Adley gets called up, you let one of them go or demote one of them, and then the other one becomes Adley's backup, maybe for a good amount of time. Um, Chancisco has not been that, and and Severino has been fine offensively. He's been kind of what we expected from him, what we've seen from him throughout his Orioles career offensively, but he's not a above average defensive catcher did catch John means is no hitter though that he did. Um, but chance Cisco, according to stat cast is in the zero with percentile in pitch framing. That's not good. I didn't think that was possible. Don't you have to be in some kind of percentile? Like, even if you're really good, you're not in the 100th. Are you in the 100th percentile? Yeah, you can be in the 100th percentile. I think that just means you're that means you're better, better than, but technically, that technically, it requires some rounding right. because you can't be better you are than in a, the very upper echelon. You're better than ninety nine point nine 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 whatever percent of people because you. Right. It means that you're better than a percentage. Right. So you can't be better than one hundred percent of them if you're in the group. <laughs> Which means conversely, <laughs> if you're rounding, Cisco that means you're rounding down though is better than zero <laughs> percent yeah. of catchers in, in terms of pitch. Framing. In terms of pitch framing, pitch framing is not everything. Just, but it's also not nothing. It, it, when we go to Robo Umps, is pitch framing going to be totally obsolete? Like, is that going to be a skill that is no longer necessary at all? I don't know. That's a very, well, maybe. Because if you think about it, if the, the Umps always going to get it right, why do you have to fool them? So, be the, so Chance Cisco's hope for his so, bad pitch framing is just wait for Robo Umps. <laughs> maybe. Just cross J- your fingers. JT Rio Muto's contract, worthless at that point. <laughs> Uh, Pretty much. Yeah. Um, but he has not been great. At, and he's been better at throwing out runners, I will say. And certainly better than Pedro Severino has been at throwing out runners. Um, Severino really struggled at throwing out runners to start the season, especially. But Chan Sisko, offensively, similar to Rio Ruiz, is just not getting it done. Yeah. And the Orioles are in a bit of a precarious spot with Chan Sisko. Because the guys that you would call up to replace him as your backup catcher are not great options either. Uh, You've got Brett Cumberland, who is 25 years old, just one year younger than Chance Sisko. He's hitting 211 through six games with AAA. Obviously, again, a small sample size. But Brett Cumberland has never really been somebody who Orioles fans or the Orioles organization has looked at and said, yeah, we got to 
figure out a way to get Brett Cumberland to the majors. Yeah, he's, he's, not, he's not never been a top prospect. No, he's he's moved his way throughout the minor league system, but he's never really flashed at the plate. He has never really had any top tools that you will say, hey, maybe that'll develop into something great in a few years. He's just always been a fine minor league catcher, so he's not exactly pounding at the door to get to the major league level. The other option is Austin Wins who had his chance at the major league level a few years ago. He hit just 214 in the major leagues with Baltimore in 2019. He is hitting 273 through four games in AAA so far this year, but he's 30 years old. Yeah, That's four years older than Chance Sisko. So you're kind of caught in between a rock and a hard place where Chance Sisko isn't really getting it done at the major league level, but outside of Adley Rutschman, there is really no catcher at the minor league level where you're saying, okay, we've got to give this guy a shot. Which is why we've seen under Mike Elias, the Orioles invest in the off season in a backup catcher. It's why they signed, you know, uh, Jesus Sucre. It's why they signed uh, Brian holiday as like these veteran backup catchers, because they know that there is a large gap. It's Adley Rutschman. And then every other catcher in the organization, um, you know, there's such a large gap there. So, yeah, they, they don't have a, a suitable replacement. Unlike with the Bannon and Jones conversation, there really isn't anybody ready to take the spot. I'd argue I'd rather see Austin wins again. We haven't seen him at the major league level since 2019. He didn't play at all in 2020 at the big league level. He was at the alternate site. But at some point, Chance Cisco's struggles especially with pitch framing in the lineup, that's one thing, and that's going to that's gonna drag you down. Especially pitch framing behind the plate. When you're catching some young pitchers, you're going to be catching Keegan Aiken and Dean Kramer. Um, you're going to be catching Zach Lowther at some point soon. That's hurting your pitchers. That's, you know, sometimes can be causing your pitchers to have longer innings than they may need that drives their pitch count up that has, leads to laborious innings that leads to you know, them struggling. And you that's not what you want right now. That's why for the same, it's the same line of thinking with why uh, Elias has invested in middle infielders in free agency. Obviously not much, but he's invested in uh, Jose Iglesias. He invested in Freddie Galvis because they were plus defenders at shortstop because he wanted to help out his young pitchers because he wanted to make sure that when a ball is hit to the shortstop, he makes an out, um, which just helps your your pitchers get through these innings so I think by a similar token you got to look at the catcher spot and say at some point you might be hurting your young pitchers you do and it seems like there should be some kind of change at the catcher spot but I just don't know if I want to take out 26 year old Chance Cisco and bring in 30 year old Austin wins yeah Austin wins is also pretty bad defensively he is not good at pitch framing Chance Cisco is worse, but Austin Wins is also not good. So what is the trade-off between somebody who is slightly better at pitch framing versus somebody like Chance Cisco, who you talked about the young pitchers? Chance Cisco at least has had the time to work with Dean Kramer, to work with some of these younger pitchers at the major league level. I know Austin Wins has been at AAA, so maybe he's had a little bit more experience with maybe Zach Lowther, Mike Bauman, Keegan Aiken. But at what point do you say maybe the relationship that Chance Cisco has built with some of these pitchers at the major league level is more valuable than making a change to a 30-year-old catcher who had his chance at the major league level and didn't prove himself? Chance, pun intended. Uh, But the yes, I will say, I agree. I think that that's like a valid line of thinking. But there does have to be a certain point. You know, he's hitting 156. Cisco is hitting 156 at this point. Uh, and obviously in the zeroth percentile in pitch framing, what does that average have to go down to before you force a change, before you have to get um, somebody else in there because he's just not good enough? Right. It's a a question more of is there a better option rather than should the change be made? I think it's pretty obvious that there should be some kind of shakeup, but there's just not really a good option to yeah. shake things up with. And I, there's also no really good free agent catchers at this point. I mean, unless you want to bring back Matt Wieters, who's still a free agent and is yeah. 30-something years old. 
But I don't know. I, I think personally, I would rather stick with Chance Cisco because he's younger and maybe you're saying, okay, he has a little bit more time to develop, just like you were saying with Rio Ruiz and Ramon Arias. They're just 26 years old. So maybe right. there's a little bit of room for growth there versus an Austin Wins who's 30 years old and Brett Cumberland who has never really shown all that much promise. Matt Reeder signing would be big for somebody's team in the all Opasi draft that we did. It would <laughs> back in uh, January. Yeah. Who drafted him? Connor Newcomb. That would be Connor Newcomb. Figured. Yep. yep. <laughs> hey, I ended up with Charles Johnson. So I think, uh, I think I came on. And the then wrong you immediately tried to take him back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen the all Opasi draft, go back, give it a watch. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, that some some change will occur there. Again, it's not as natural a fit as uh, and as easy a, a question to answer as just bring up Bannon or Jones there. Right. Um, one more spot, not in the lineup that I want to mention, but in the bullpen. Orioles' bullpen has been better than expected. Surprisingly board, good again. Surprisingly good again. Paul Fry has been excellent. Yep. It's been low-key one of the best left-handed relievers in the majors this season which is just awesome to see. Uh, Tanner Scott still struggling with walks, but we see the flashes are there. Um, Cesar Valdez, I don't want to hear your negativity. If anybody has any negative things to say about Cesar Valdez, yeah, keep I'm, it in. I'm sorry. Don't want to hear it. The guy no. is 36. He pitched in the, the Mexican League most recently. He has a dead fish changeup that he throws 80% of the time, and he gets big leaguers to swing and miss at a high rate. He has also been very good this season. He has. I know he has a few blown saves. He's three. But he's been very good. And the last one, I would argue, was a, and Brandon Hindwood as well, was a little bit unlucky. Yes. He gave up some bloop hits. There were some bad defensive plays in that ninth inning in which he blew that save up at City Field. So let's, let's you know, calm down with the, with the Cesar Valdez talk. Yeah. He, you got Cesar Valdez for nothing and... Uh, I, I and he's been way better than he has been unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but other than that, Sean Armstrong is still having his, his struggles. Yes. Uh, came in yesterday for Matt Harvey, gave up runs that were charged to Harvey, but, um, you know, I think there were two outs in that inning and he allowed the runners to score. Um, so that's still not good. Um, he's now still has a, an ERA up over 10 in 13 games. It's, it's difficult because he is unlike... Rio Ruiz and those guys, he is out of options. So if you want to try to option him, he's got to be subject to waivers, and then he's got to clear those waivers and accept an option. So are you ready yet, Brendan, to pull that Band-Aid off? Uh, maybe. Okay. Maybe. He has calmed down a little bit. He had his first four appearances of the year were horrendous, and since those four outings, his ERA is just a 6.23, which is still not good. Still bad. I'm, I'm not going to argue that a 6.23 ERA is good. However, if he had a 6.23 ERA for the season, we would not be looking at it more than likely in the same light that we are looking at it right now. We would just be saying that Sean Armstrong is having a rough start to the season, and hopefully he will pick it up as he goes along. But I don't think we would be clamoring for Sean Armstrong to be replaced by somebody else in the Orioles' bullpen. So from that perspective, I think he will probably get a little bit more time because he has calmed down in his more recent appearances. But his hits per nine are still really bad. He's he's giving up 14 hits per nine. He has a whip of 2.25. None of those numbers are good. And I think the thing that's working against Sean Armstrong is that unlike Chance Sisko and more like Rio Ruiz and Ramon Arias, there are guys in the Orioles minor league system right now that could take that spot pretty much immediately and probably put up better numbers than Sean Armstrong is putting up right now. You mentioned Zach Lowther and Keegan Aiken. Isaac Matson made his major league debut. I think any of those guys are probably worth a shot in the Orioles bullpen, especially if Armstrong continues to struggle. Yeah. Uh, you know, Zach Lowther, obviously, we think he's going to be a starter long-term, and I think he has, still has that potential. But for his rookie year, there's, there's no... Uh, shame in, in trying him out as a reliever and seeing what he can give you there. And maybe you give him some low leverage spots to kind of get his feet wet. Isaac Matson is a little bit more of a natural fit to replace Sean Armstrong because 
Um, he is a reliever and has been uh, throughout his, his minor league career over the last few years. So Matson, you know, already made his big league debut, gave up a run, and he has given up a run as well with Norfolk. So, you know, maybe he's not quite ready. Maybe he needs a little bit more seasoning in the minor leagues, but that call is going to be made at some point. And I don't know if it's, if it's going to be Sean Armstrong's spot that he's going to take, but we're going to see uh, Isaac Matson be a reliever at the big league level. Question is just how much time are they are they going to give Sean Armstrong here? Because he was excellent in 2020. Right. Excellent. And a 180 ERA, uh, struggled with injuries, but they clearly are hoping that what some of that he can recapture right. in, in 2021. And maybe he doesn't turn into a trade piece like Paul Fry has, has now kind of turned himself into, but they need some innings. From guys yeah and, and he's just not giving them quality in and that's why you're holding out hope for sean armstrong right. is you are hoping that you can deal him at the deadline but he has just not but, been good enough yeah. so far this season that i don't know if a contending team is going to look at sean armstrong's first 13 games of the season and just overlook it well i think i think at this point we're into may i think it's probably past that for sean arm i think that ship may have sailed I would unless agree. unless he has an incredible next couple months i think brandon Hyde just wants innings yeah from sean armstrong and he is not getting good enough innings but if you're going to just have a reliever on your team that you're going to bring in in low leverage situation that you think is going to give up a, a, at least a few runs in that scenario but it doesn't really matter i would argue that it would be more valuable to call up somebody like keegan aiken keep him in the bullpen or somebody like zach lowther Bring them in in those lower leverage situations and say it doesn't really matter if you're giving up runs. We're losing this game anyway or we're, we're winning by a bunch of runs already and just put them in that bullpen spot where they can get a few innings of work here and there and then hopefully, especially in the case of somebody like Keegan Aiken or Zach Lowther, you're able to, from there, transition them into maybe that fourth or fifth spot in the rotation that's been a bit of a revolving door so far. Well, Aiken already has one spot. I think... I think they might have too many guys that are kind of lower leverage, so to speak. Because, right. you know, Tyler Wells already kind of has that spot. When Max Roller comes back from injury, he will kind of have that spot as well, where they don't want to throw them in a high leverage situation. The only really high leverage guys they have right now are like Paul Fry, Cesar Valdez, who obviously is their closer, and Tanner Scott. Right. Beyond those three, they kind of have a group of innings eaters. And... Well, Cole Solser has been very good as well. He has. He has. Um, not closer good, but he, is, he has been solid as well. And, and Adam Plutko, I think, as well, you could bring in Plutko, in relatively course, yeah. high leverage situations. Could, how could I forget Plutko? Yes. I apologize. <laughs> uh, Plutko has been very good. Yeah. Uh, he has been great. Um, but other than that, you know, they... And, and Jorge Lopez might also, at some point, transition over to the bullpen as well. Right. If, they, if there is a natural spot for somebody to take. Right. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, but I think that, you know, that that spot for Sean Armstrong is is becoming uh, easier and easier to fill. Yes. Especially if you were going to keep him in those lower leverage situations, I would rather put a, a prospect in there where, it, like I said, it doesn't really matter if they give up runs. You were just trying to get them experience at the major league level. What difference does it make whether it's, you know, Zach Lowther or Isaac Matson versus Sean Armstrong. Either way, you're pretty much fine with whatever happens because it's a low leverage situation. But I would rather give the innings to Lowther and Matson at this point. Yeah, I definitely understand that line of thinking. We'll see if if something gives there. And we'll see if something gives with the other position battles that we discussed as well. Um, whether Rylan Bannon, Jemai Jones, somebody gets a call up at some point. Even Austin wins. Yeah, perhaps. I, I think um, if I were to guess who the next person to get called up would be. I would probably say Ryland Bannett at Me this too. point. Me too. I think he has performed really well at AAA through his small sample size. And because the Orioles lineup has been pretty mundane so far, I think you need a spark. Yeah. And I think Ryland Bannon can provide that while covering the same positions that Rio Ruiz can. And he's in the same kind of class, so to speak, that like, uh, the 40-man roster class being added with Zach Lowther, with Alexander Wells, um, you know, those, Yusniel Diaz, those guys. So he, right. is, he is in the, on the cusp 
um, yes. of, of being added to the 26-man roster. All right, give Brendan a follow at Brendan Morty. Give me a follow at Paul Mancano. Let us know what you think. Rate, sub- subscribe, review, five stars, all that good stuff. Watch if you don't watch the podcast as well. Um, thank you so much for tuning in here on this Thursday. Go out and enjoy your, your beautiful off day. Your, yeah. your lovely uh, Orioles off day. O's are coming back home to face the Yankees because they missed them so much. Yeah. It's been so long since they faced the New York Yankees. Uh, they are coming home to face them. So let us know if you're going down to the game as well this weekend at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm Paul. He's Brendan. We'll catch you next time.